right, good morning. I just went for a gorgeous walk outside. It's beautiful out today. And we're back to Martin and Hidden Talents. And he's trying to make a big discovery. And his friends are not making it easy for him. So today, I wanted to ask one of my favorite questions, because I really think it's always interesting to see what the author's trying to tell us. And Dave Lubar is the author of Hidden Talents. And so my question today is, what is the author's message? Think about that. What is the author trying to teach us or have us understand through Martin's discoveries or Martin's testing? Okay, because that'll make it really interesting for us. Um, the title of this chapter, which I had started the other day but I got cut off, is Believe Me Alone. And I'm guessing I'm going to get cut off again, but we'll see what happens. Okay. I watched them leave, then plunked down on my bed. It's true, I said to Torchy. Every single word I said is true. I looked it all up. It's in the books. I couldn't understand why Cheater had gotten so angry. It didn't make any sense at all. Maybe Flinch was angry about the milk. Okay, I could see that. But still, the stuff I was trying to tell him was way more important than a pair of wet pants. Torchy sighed. It would be nice if you were right, he said. I really didn't start those fires. Honest. I know, I told him. That's what I've been trying to explain. But everyone acted like I was out of my mind. Don't you see? This means you didn't do anything bad. At least, not on purpose. You and Flinch and Cheetah aren't like the other kids at Edgeview. You don't belong here. You're innocent. If I could convince Torchy, I figured I could get him to help me with uh, the others. But Torchy glared at me. So the only person who believes me is a crazy kid, and he thinks I'm some kind of freak who can start fires with my mind. Wonderful. Maybe I can get a job in a circus. He dropped down in his chair and picked up a magazine. But... I didn't know what else I could say to convince him. For a moment, I sat on the edge of my bed and watched Torchy. As he read, I could have sworn that I saw a small wisp of smoke rise up from the front cover of the magazine, right where he held it. Maybe it was my imagination. I sniffed the air. There seemed to be a faint burning order, oh, order, odor, but our room always smelled like that. I kept watching, but there was no more smoke. Why didn't he believe me? It was so obvious. I thought about all the time I'd spent in the library. Couldn't they see I was trying to help them out? I'd even miss lunch for them. The least they could do was think about what I'd said, and Torchy, who claimed to be my friend, had let me down the worst. All he had to do was start one stinking little fire while the others were watching and they'd know that I was right. One lousy, stinking little fire. That wasn't a lot to ask. But he hadn't done it. I looked at him, sitting there with his stupid magazine, moving his lips as he read. It was amazing. He was actually stumbling through life, totally unaware of his abilities. I got off the bed and walked over to him. There had to be some way to make him understand. When I opened my mouth, the wrong thing came out. If you were smart, you'd believe me, I told him. But I guess you're not very bright. Face it, you're probably not even smart enough to be called stupid. You need another 10 or 20 IQ points to reach that level. Torchy threw down his magazine. He looked like he wanted to stand up and take a swing at me. I almost hoped he would, but he just said, I'm as smart as I need to be. He stared at me as if daring me to say another word. I kept my mouth shut. Torchy picked up his magazine and went back to reading. I crossed the floor, flopped on my bed, and turned toward the wall. The silence in the room grew heavier with every passing minute broken only by the rustle of each page that Torchy turned. The crinkle of the paper reminded me of the crackle of a fire. I knew I'd been wrong to say those things to him, wrong and rotten. Just thinking about it made me feel guilty. I took a deep breath, then told him, I'm sorry. That's okay. He still sounded hurt. I knew it wasn't really okay. He didn't say anything else, and I didn't know what to say to him. 
Damn, what was wrong with me? I couldn't even fit in with the freaks and the misfits. After Torchy and the others had let me into their group so quickly, I figured things would be okay here. It was my own fault. I'd been stupid enough to believe I'd make friends. I sat on my bed and looked around. Torchy was just a few feet from me, and dozens of other kids were right down the hall. There were kids everywhere, but I managed to end up alone. Way to go, Martin. From the moment I'd gotten to Edgeview, Torchy had been friendly. Now he didn't even want to look at me. I stood up and let my eyes wander around the room. The wall above my bed was bare and empty. There was hardly any sign that someone besides Torchy had lived in this space during the last three weeks. I'm going out, I said. He didn't answer. I left the room and walked down the hall looking at the closed doors lining both sides of the corridor and knowing that I had no place to go. Nobody wanted to see me. Nobody cared. It felt almost like being at home. Oof. That's a painful statement right there. In the car, coming back to Edgeview, lucky. Mind if I turn on the radio? Mr. Carbalzi, as long as it isn't that modern stuff, lucky. Oldies? Mr. Carb, Calabarzi, sure, lucky. Hey, that new kid I told you about last month, remember? Mr. Calabarzi, no, lucky. You know the one in Torchy's room? Mr. Calabarzi, right, Ooh, lucky. I think he might be okay. I wasn't sure at first, but he seems like an okay guy. I trust him on my side if things got tough. Mr. Calabrese, if things get tough, leave the room. Besides, if he's okay, what's he doing at Edgeview? Lucky, hey, what about me? I'm there, Mr. Calabrese said. I know. A lot of mixed feelings here. If I told you once, if I was working away from a bad situation, if I was walking away from a bad situation, I was walking into one that was worse. I realized my mistake halfway down the hall when I came face to face with Bloodbath and three of his gang, Grunge, Lip, and the guy with the skull tattoo on his forehead. Hey, this is a toll road, Bloodbath said, holding his hands out. Pay up. I don't have anything, I told him, taking a step back. Grunge and Lip took two steps forward. Everyone has something, Bloodbath said. Before I could move, Grunge grabbed me in, the he in a headlock. The sharp, ripe smell of his unwatched shirt smacked me like a punch to the nose. I tried to pull away, but his arm tightened, locking around me like a giant handcuff. Lip and Skullface flipped my pockets inside out. Three quarters dropped to the floor, followed by a fluttering green rectangle. I tried not to stare at it. Nothing, Grunge asked, tightening his grip around my neck. That don't look like nothing. Lip scooped up the quarters and handed them to Bloodbath. Next time you lie to me, Bloodbath said, I'll break something, understand? Yeah. Bloodbath danced down at the floor. Since yesterday, when I'd shoved it in my pocket at the arcade. I'd forgotten all about the ticket. What's that? Bloodbath asked, tapping the ticket with the toe of his sneaker. I came within a breath of saying, it's from the arcade, but I couldn't. I'd given my word to keep the secret, even after the way Torchy and the others had treated me. I wasn't going to rat them out. <coughs> At least the ticket had fallen face down, so it wasn't obvious that it was an arcade ticket. I tried to remember what was written on the front. Hey, Grunge snapped, squeezing my neck so hard that things started to turn gray. The man asked you a question. If he caught me lying, I was dead. It's my lucky ticket, I said. I've had it for years. They all laughed. Doesn't seem to be working very well, Bloodbath said. He must have given some signal because Grunge unclamped his arm from my neck. But Grunge wasn't quite done. Instead of just letting me go, he pushed me hard. I was off balance. I staggered and fell. Man, this job pays lousy, Bloodbath said, jiggling the quarters in his hand as he walked away. I glared after them, then reached out and turned the ticket over. On the front, in giant levers, it said Mondo Video. I shoved it back in my pocket. As much as I didn't want to return to the room, it seemed safer than staying in the hall. It would have been very pleasant to... 
It wouldn't be very pleasant to be around if Bloodbath wandered back. There really wasn't any choice. I headed to the room. Torchy didn't even look up when I came in. It was obvious he didn't want to talk. <clears throat> if he knew what I'd just been through, if he knew how well I'd kept his secret, maybe he'd feel differently. I tried to think of some way to tell him, but I couldn't think of any way to start. In my mind, I saw myself talking, and I saw him just staring, not really caring what I said. I don't care either, I told myself as I went to sleep. Right. Unlike bloodbath, I didn't believe my lies. Memo to all staff from Principal Davies. Subject, state evaluation. With our inspection just slightly more than four months away, we need to finalize our preparations. This is too crucial to leave for the last minute. All right, boys and girls, have a great day. Bye.